If they're training, if these big corporations are training the corpus of an LLM, then their agenda is what will come through the LLM. I think you've seen, like you mentioned woke, for example, a minute ago, like I think you saw just a month ago or so, um, a lot of woke comments coming, coming through a lot of woke uh, commentary coming through some of the big corporation um, AI. And we saw, we saw backlash to that. And, you know, what's the alternative? You know, the whole the whole point of LLM is you're training it on known knowledge. Well, the, the alternative is open source, right? Like what Meta is trying to do, where we have a lot of different points of view, all building and creating more innovation on top of, of AI. But the points of view that the AI is going to learn from are the majority points of view. The majority points of view are awful, are terrible, are horrible, right? So, right. so right. you know, so most applications, so let's say the LLM gives a high score to academic research, academic papers because, you know, it's academia, you know. Well, but academia is overwhelmingly dominated by the left. So uh, it's going to give a higher score to anything that has a leftist bias. And I can't blame the LLM or the programmers how are you going to rank them? How are you going to give scores, even if it's open source? What, what are you going to do? I mean, the fact is that people on the right don't go into academia. They don't write. So they have a few think tanks. But the number of papers they produce far, uh, far smaller than the number of papers the left produces. So the left is going to dominate LLMs. Just accept that. You know, the, the idea that, that somehow you can avoid that is absurd unless you have a right-wing LLM. And then you're doing exactly... The same thing, but the opposite. The same and, thing. And right. LLM, by definition, cannot be objective because objectivity requires a human mind. Only human beings can be objective. Objectivity means human beings identifying reality. Uh, objectivity doesn't mean taking into account all points of view because most points of view are nonsense. Objectivity means the search for the truth, which means interacting directly with reality. And only human beings can interact with reality. Only human beings can tell a LLM what's true and what's not what is objective and what's not. So the LLMs, by definition, are going to give us societal bias. And we just have to accept that and then work with it. I'm laughing because then you get these like big anti-tech politicians who really aren't familiar with the technology at the level you're talking about. And like, essentially, if they're not looking at it from the human side, the objective side, are they just regulating math? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's all they're doing, well, right? They're at the end of the day, an algebra. LLM is algebra. Hmm? They're regulating the outcome of math, how, uh, the outcome right. of, of a statistic algorithm. That's all an LLM that so is. Absurd. Right? It's, a, it's a kind of statistical algorithm. That, and, and basically, if, if woke dominates the media, the LLM will be woke. And if, if Christianity dominates the, the media, the LLM will be Christian. The, the LLM can't discover truth. Truth is not something an, a, an artificial thing can contemplate. It can't because it doesn't contemplate. The, it, I mean... Artificial intelligence has no intelligence. It's not intelligent in the human sense. It doesn't integrate data from sense collection and actually uh, conceptualize it. It just accepts what it's being given and it manipulates it using statistical tools. But all that can do is, uh, you know, it can create, it, it can tell you what is commonly available out there. It can't tell you what is true. But it could empower the individual, right? Like, so if you think about generative AI and its ability to help the individual create, write music, write scripts, create uh, videos, create films, and then, you know, give them economic opportunity to compete against the legacy, let's say, creative fields, Hollywood, publishing, um, fashion industry, the individual could flourish from using these technologies. They would never be able to compete with big film studios, but now they can in a more efficient way from a time perspective, Absolutely. a money perspective, and even creatively, right? So AI is this amazing tool that's going to change the world. It's not going to change the world because the machine is going to do the thinking for us. It's going to change the world by providing us with a tool that makes us much smarter and gives us access to an array of information an ability to manipulate data, like if you've seen this stuff, text to video stuff, is stunning. It's 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 stunning the ability of a of 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 AI to create video, right? Not to copy video, but to create it. So uh, this is a this is a tool that's going to be that's going to change everything. It's it, it it allows us to take massive amounts of data and biotech and 
figure out uh, how proteins fold and, uh, and uh, come up with new proteins that we've never even been able to conceive of. And, but it's not going to tell us truth. <laughs> it's just going to give us information that we need to decide is it true or not. And we need to then guide it in order to create something of use and something of benefit. But it is going to change the world. And I think that the result of that is people are afraid because they don't understand it and they don't know it and nobody's making the effort to explain it to them. Everybody's so obsessed with AI is going to become conscious, going to take over the world. And that's what all uh, you know sci- sci-fi movies are about. Instead of actually some adult, some AI scientist, just explain this to us. And she, for example, explain to us why it won't come alive. You know, life is a biological phenomena, for example, and not a, a, a zero one phenomena. And there is a difference between biology and computers. They're not the same. And I mean, and, and explain to us how our lives are going to be better from this. I mean, there is a movement in Silicon Valley uh, of kind of tech optimism uh, uh, that, uh, you know, Mark Andreessen and others uh, are talking about. And I'm excited about that because that's, the, you know, they're trying to bring reason and rationality to this discussion. Um, but our, our politicians are going to, you see, politicians feed on fear. Fear is how they attain power. They, they can, conv- you know, you're afraid. They convince you that your fear is justified. And then they convince you that only they can uh, relieve you of the fear. Trust them. They will take care of it for you. And that's how they attain power, whether it's fear of immigrants or fear of trade or fear of the other, fear of Jews, fear of uh, fear of AI. Don't worry, we've got it under control. Just vote for us and we'll take care of it. Can technology push back against that, your own? Can technology, for example, help those individuals who are living in oppressive regimes to, you know, get free speech, to topple governments? We, you know, during the Arab Spring, we thought that social media was going to help, but it really hasn't done anything. If you look back in time now, it really has not helped. They're still living in oppressive regimes. So does tech, it's kind of interesting. I've had conversations conversations with colleagues in China, for example, where focusing on cryptocurrency, they've said to me, this is great. I can now get paid how I want to be paid without government intrusion. I could use NFTs to move content back and forth that I wouldn't be able to access otherwise, including like Netflix movies. Um, can technology help those individuals in repress in oppressive regimes? Yes, but technology primarily amplifies whatever's in the culture. So in Arab Spring, for example, in Egypt, what, 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 the, what the technology amplified was the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> and then, you, so, 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 so when you got an election, you, Muslim Brotherhood won and everybody was surprised. I wasn't. I was like, look, the, the technology didn't change the culture. The culture was Muslim Brotherhood. All the technology did is amplified them and, and, and gave them a voice. And then they took over. And then everybody regretted the Arab Spring, right? Because it led to, that it, you know, technology led to the civil war. You know, the Arab Spring led to civil war in Egypt, in, in Syria, which has killed tens of thousands, nobody cares, and displaced millions and just being horrific and barbaric. And that's what it led to. And what did technology do? It amplified a million different horrible voices within Syria because it's not like there are any good guys in Syria, right? They're just degrees of evil, in, in among among the different Syrian parties fighting each other. They all hate, they're all bad. They're all anti-freedom. But they're all anti-freedom in different ways and in different variations and all hate each other. So technology does that. Now, if you already be- want to be free, then yes, if you're in China and, 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 and you want freedom, then yeah, you want to get your money out. You know, crypto is a good way to get your money out of China uh, uh, using crypto. If you if you want to watch a Netflix movie, you can do that. But is that going to change the regime? Is that going to have an impact on your day-to-day life beyond being able to move your money around or, or watch a movie that they don't let you? Maybe in the very long run, because you'll, you'll get used to having a little bit of freedom. But they had more freedom 10 years ago. I mean, I was in China up until 19, uh, uh, 2018. I was in China pretty regularly. And freedom was increasing in many respects. And then starting in 2016, 17, 18, it started clamping down. And what did the Chinese people do? Nothing. They accepted it. So 
the fact that they have a little bit of freedom doesn't mean they're not willing to give it up. Is, is, it, is it like a human condition where like we, we individuals anywhere on the planet don't want freedom or we shy away from freedom? It's certainly not the case, as George Bush said, that what is it? Freedom is in the heart of every human being on the planet. Freedom is a massive achievement, a massive achievement. Like for, you know, how long have human beings been around? You know, uh, 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 as, uh, uh, as homo sapiens, a few hundred thousand years. How many of those years have been free? Have human beings been free? Like 200, 300, I including the city states in Greece, maybe 400, 500 years we've had freedom. The rest... 99.99% of human life has been lived under no freedom. The reality is that freedom is a massive achievement. And it, you can't appreciate what's going on in the world unless you realize kind of how much people fought for freedom and how, and, and the kind of intellectual battle that they had to fight. Greece and the Enlightenment are the two most important periods in human history because they're the periods in which people fought for freedom. They fought for the ideas that necessitated freedom. And, you know, today the Enlightenment is poo pooed by the left because it advocates for reason and individualism. It's poo pooed by the right because it's anti religion. Everybody's abandoned the Enlightenment. If you abandon the Enlightenment, you abandon liberty, you abandon freedom. And people are willing to do that, uh, you know, in, in the name of comfort, in the name of security, in the name of I don't have to think for myself, life is rough. Um, it's shocking. I mean, look how many people live in Russia today. They just accept Putin. They just accept it. They don't fight it. They don't, you know, maybe maybe they don't like him, but they don't fight it. They're, and they're not even willing to get up and move, right? So a lot of young people, when the war broke out, left Russia to uh, Kazakhstan and Georgia. But a lot stayed. Uh, look at Iran. Um, Thirty, yeah, thirty percent of the population is is, you know, pretty secular and would love to replace the regime and gone out and demonstrated. Thirty percent is pretty really really conservative and believes in this regime. And, and they, they, they want to be slaves. And then there's 40% that just doesn't care. They're kind of, they, they're just struggling with day-to-day -day life and they're not willing to change anything. And they, they don't want to be free enough to go onto the streets or to risk anything for it. So you've got 30% who doesn't want to be free, 40% who is not willing to risk anything for freedom, and 30% who want to be free, but they're only 30%. I mean, how many people in America... <laughs> How many American people in America would have signed the Declaration of Independence and gone to war with the British? If, if you put it to a vote in the colonies, it would have failed. Far less than 50% were willing to, uh, what was the end of the Declaration of Independence? We, 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 we stake our, uh, our uh, lives, property, and honor, right? Because they knew that if they lost, they would be hung, their property would be taken from them, and, and they put everything on the line. And some people rallied to their cause. And some people thought, eh, too busy. And some people sided with the British. And that's always the case. And luckily for humanity, the founding fathers won, right? But it, the reality is that it's always a minority that fights, really is willing to fight for freedom. And um, that minority is shrinking because of bad ideas.